it's our community and as always I am delighted to invite you in to meet a very interesting young man and his name is Andre mm -hmm. Zelinsky and he has a show that is at the moment at the Nerman and it is going to move on but his art will remain because the Nerman owns uh, several pieces of his art and he has can I say beginning to make it big that's flattering and I like the sound of that so we can go with that okay <laughs> <laughs> he's just gotten a new honor and the honor it's just just recent isn't yeah it? I found out last evening last evening and it's artform.com which is a um, a digital magazine yep. and hard copy they do oh, they have, have hard copy too yeah, but they've kind of moved more into online presence online. well that's the way the world's going uh, yes. as you well know but in the critics um, pick section they have selected uh, just a very few shows worldwide and they picked open source as one of those very few D tell me where some of the others are I mean as it kind of boggles my mind when yeah in, in domestically in the United States several of them will be like um, you know in Portland <laughs> New York Chicago and then next to Overland Park you'll see like you know Berlin you know and um, you know Paris and these kind of things so it's you know, it's very nice to see that. Um, isn't that. I just think, see, isn't that wonderful? And we live in a community that is really recognized worldwide for some of the things that we have. And Ange is um, local. He's a local boy. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it even, even better. They, t they refer to your um, art as totemic paintings and sculptures. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Well, that can mean several things. And we, we can see that in the show. Right. Yeah. But I, I would take it, I guess, more in a, a metaphorical, literal, metaphorical way in that I have, I've described on a few occasions my work as having, especially the sculptures, as having this kind of totem pole of the history of technology with, you know, you have the Stone Age, the bronze, um, Metal, woodworking and plastics and this all coalesces into like a digital um, idea so it's kind of total pole growing kind of idea so to yeah. me that's where it goes and I, I kind of like this one it um, and when you say you know totem pole it see it it occurs to me and mm -hmm. you know art is a, a great deal in the eyes of the beholder so what I think of as a totem pole with things built as mm -hmm. you say, mm -hmm. on one another, and I, I like maybe I like the colors in this. I'm, I'm not sure what it is about it. I like, but I like that, and that's one of the of the uh, uh, three dimensional uh, mm -hmm. objects in the show, and and there are there are uh, several others. I mean, I it says that <laughs> I, I see. I there's another one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what what is that depict? Uh, a screen? This, a screen, the mm -hmm. center of it, the black where you see the mm -hmm. kind of green coming through, this kind of like universe or stars or maybe a computer starting up. I mean, they need not have specific literal meetings, but to me, what generates them is the machine that I'm kind of depicting. But from there, I let, let things kind of go. I let the materials speak to themselves and be kind of honest in what they are. Well, and, and in the, the comments that are made about the exhibit, they, they say as objects, windows of utility grow narrower and narrower, mm -hmm. and constant updates and overhauls, and the gray zone has emerged for some of these apparatuses that are still kind of useful, mm -hmm. kind of useful. Yes. And uh, a man by the name of Walter Benjamin, what I, which I thought was really kind of good, described it as the utopian glow afforded to technological devices in their final hours. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they do have a kind of, <clears throat> you know, as technology moves on and, and and you look back, there's this there's this space of retro and then cutting edge. You have people waiting hours and you know days camped out in front of an Apple store ready for the that's new right. thing. That's right. And then you have people with uh, like this kind of cult following of old technology. I refuse to move on. And so, in, in, in if you see a movie and you see some of this old technology, you kind of laugh or giggle, you know. Remember, you know. And but what what ends up happening also, 
that I found out that I find interesting. If you go over to somebody's house and you don't know how to turn on their entertainment system or anything, you're completely lost. It's like a it's like going into a labyrinth of unknowable <laughs> buttons. And then once you they show you, you're completely fine. You know, you don't even think about it anymore. But until it happens, all this is mysterious because you can't see in any of these things. You can't pick up the you know open it up and these kind of things. And I find all all that really fascinating. So when I make these objects. I want to exude like their own personality, like through color and through these distortions and through the natural objects. Well, the, another comment in, in the uh, blurb that that art form <coughs> sent out was that you release them from the constraints of commodity value. Yeah, um, th they become other, you know, They're, they aren't the, the exact replica of a, uh, air, you know, uh, iBook or something like that, or a, a particular piece of uh, commodity, or you know, or, or, or a particular brand, and those brands have their own initiative. You know, there's lots of people that go into thinking about how to design those, how to market those, and in a way, I really can't compete with that. Um, so the best thing is to bring it into like my world, and in, in, in this way, kind of open the natural world back up through these things that... But that's what artists do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you must find me very fascinating because I use a telephone book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't, and getting a telephone book these days, is n the white pages, is not easy. Right. It took me two or three months to get a new white pages, yeah. but I must have a telephone book. So there you go. Mm -hmm. I need to, uh, you know, I always um, want to know, do you have a favorite in the show? Yeah, I, I have been developing a favorite, and um, at this moment, uh, it's probably a tie between two. And there's is two it pictured in the in the show in the general picture of the show? Um, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah. we can look at that, and maybe we can, we can yeah. pick it out. Yeah. Which 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 two are they? Well, one is a piece that's m predominantly black, and it's pretty large. Uh -huh. And the bottom is a piece of Chinese marble, and the top is different kinds of fiberglass and um, and also chips from the rock below kind of welded or glued on. And then the other one is um, a green and pink one where it's wood on the top, three trees that have grown together, and mm -hmm. the bottom's bronze, and you can actually see through it. And um, Is one of them in there? Not in that particular Not in that shot, okay. Um, but these, these particular pieces are interesting because they, um, it's, it's more of where I can go with them, what ideas I got making them, mm -hmm. that I have seen new, like, you know, rabbit holes for the Alice in Wonderland kind of thing. Yeah. Of, you know, like, they, they open up doors for me in my head about possibilities. And also the scale um, also was, was a nice, because uh, it, it's also one of those things where you, you feel kind of accomplished that you worked that large without breaking the marble. Um, I, I taught myself to carve rocks, and since I use so many different kinds of them, I learn quite quickly different things. You know, some just don't uh, can't be carved; they're more chipped, like they break like an arrowhead. And that black stone was like that. Yeah, but see, you're talking to me, and what you're talking about is rock. You're mm. not talking about color. Mm. It's the rock that appeals to you. The rock, yeah, in it, in its in its state, but as the rock gets formed. It, it's the relationship of everything because when I before I even picked out the rock, I had the top kind of done. I'd made this kind of screen. Well, so you do the top first. I, d I do different parts at different oh. times, and then it becomes this kind of kind of dance of how to get certain elements together, and um, and and that is where I kind of start putting things together. And I work on several pieces at once, um, and so some days where I feel like I, I haven't. I can't figure out how this could go together because it's not only with sculpture what I'd like to do, but what also is feasible from a f physical standpoint mm -hmm. and a durability mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. And it looks good. And it looks good without showing bolts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that I don't want to be seen. Well, and sometimes um, your paintings and your sculptures display sort of a distortion between the actual and the perceived space, mm -hmm. it seems to me, because some of them. I got to tell you, uh, Ange, you have to look at them a little bit, mm -hmm. and then you, it dawns on you what what it is. Mm -hmm. So it is a distortion of the of these uh, still useful items that are having their portraits done. Yeah, and oh, this is 
you know, I, I've done certain moves because I like them um, in mm -hmm. terms of like the painting and the backgrounds have these kind of big ribbons of um, paint on them and I, I always wonder like was that a shorthand for sp filling up space because I have very large brushes but recently somebody pointed out that they thought that was um, like time kind of wrapping and whisking away and changing the, the, the things. And I thought that's really great because mm -hmm. maybe that's what I really am thinking because if I knew exactly what I was doing, I probably wouldn't be doing anything because that's part of the, the lure of making art in my particular case is that I usually figure out some things and more of what I'm doing years down the road. And as I've gotten older, it's become really rewarding um, you know, to see how things are going. Because you can tell yourself one thing to tell you a story now. This is what I'm doing. I need to put this together. Uh, this is the way I feel. In three years, you can completely see it a whole different way, and that's fascinating. Well, and it also occurs to me that your creativity blossomed when you got your Master of Fine Arts at Yale. Yeah, that gave me probably more than anything else in the faculty there kind of, you know, the push and, and the, instilled the belief in myself that I could actually do this, you know, because um, I didn't make art as a kid. I, I, w I wasn't, you know, taken to museums on a regular basis or anything. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, my family discouraged it, not f out of being mean, just because they thought it was unpractical like mm -hmm. most people. And it was a gray area that they want you to be a plumber. No, I <laughs> yeah, I think they would have liked me to be a lawyer or something yeah. like this. The, the typical prototypical yeah. vocations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, I I just kept you know when I came here actually to Johnson County in my early twenties, I was really interested in history, and I took some art history and like that, and I took a few art classes, and there I was off. You know, Zygmunt's pretty, who's there a was, teacher here, yeah. and Larry Thomas, and and the art history teacher, Ann Wicklin, was just a, a terrific teacher. She was so into it. She'd been to all these places. She told you firsthand, you know. Um, and I just got, I just, I just jumped in with both feet. And um, never to return. Right. And you know, and Zig <laughs> and Larry kept pushing me. You know, like you know, they told me when the independent art colleges were in town at the Kansas City Art Institute, I'd bring some drawings up and go forward and uh, that's what I did. That's what you did. Well you know when you were at Yale you worked on collages in black and white. Yes. And um, is that one of them? This is sh shortly after Yale mm -hmm. um, but this is a drawing that kind of comes out of that black and white work. Basically what I had at Yale to put it shortly was black and white squares that were a binary code for bl uh, pulses from a computer and I, I, I got really theoretical at school because I thought that's what you were supposed to do because my teachers were from the 60s and a conceptual mm -hmm. thing. But when I moved to Rome and started making these ink drawings, this is where the idea of this is a shredder. And I thought, well, how does a shredder shred itself and what should I, how should I make it? And I thought, well, it's got to be on paper. And to simplify things, I started with the black and white and that also made sense to me because in a computer the pulses are uh, le everything's done with electrical pulses it's a it's a clock and the, the the representation of the pulse is a one or a zero in binary code and that's usually an abstract code represented as black and white and so there's I always thought about this inherent codes and I had read a lot about the, I had taken a, a computers in society class at Yale too so I got really steeped into that well, and then, then you moved a little bit, and you started with bright colors and tilted lines and, and perspective, and um, some of your commentators have likened it to uh, reminiscence of the Fauvis canvases mm -hmm. of uh, Matisse mm -hmm. and, and Chagall. Mm -hmm. And Matisse used those beautiful, mm -hmm. bright colors. I think that one is just mm -hmm. splendid. And then Chagall, again, uh, another one of the Favas. Look mm -hmm. at those wonderful bright colors and mm -hmm. tilted perspectives, if you will. Right. And, and so you are coming into a whole different um, part of your artistic maturation process. Right. And your next interest became, it sounds like a, a story. <laughs> right. Your yeah, next interest became um, ATM machines and mm -hmm. paper shredders mm -hmm. and cell phones mm -hmm. in bright colors like the Favas. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I like this one. I guess, you know, I, I, part of the appeal, in fact, much of the appeal, is the colors that you use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the paper shredder is, there he is. Yeah, I, the, f the f Fauvist artists, you know, they, they got rid of the local colors. Mm -hmm. in their, and part of this was, all, you know, the availability of paints and tubes mm -hmm. changed things. Um, but also, looking at them, th that created kind of a, a dreamier, op more optimistic, especially in Matisse's case, more optimism. And that's what I, I need. There was such a kind of glim or doom and gloom outlook with technology that you, I, you know, when I did it in gray, it, it really seemed kind of dreary. And to bounce well, that. Well, as they say, it ain't dreary now. Right. <laughs> and the bounce that using yeah. these bright colors yeah. gives it a life. And even if the shapes might be a little bit so-called uncanny or mysterious and feel a little bit monstrous, the colors kind well, of your soften. perspectives are tilted, and yeah. I think that's fun. Yeah. There's your. Um, yeah, that's an early ATM. Yeah, that's. Uh -huh. I, I just, I, I think that, um, and there is a little bit of humor here. I mean, I don't know, it, there's not a lot of people out there that would use that much magenta and pink, you know, and, and those kind of combinations. Yeah. So there is that kind of brazenness, but that's what the paint, painting could stand, you know, and, there, it, it, and it, it might look like I just did that, but I, I've actually worked really hard with those color combinations. See, but I want to pull a word out, brazenness. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about that a little bit. Well, that is my kind of interest in art, historical, like, artists that I felt like when something had to be done, they took that leap. They took, you know, without really knowing where they were going to land. And I think, you, you know, it's one of those things as an artist that I kind of feed on from time to time, and it, it requires a kind of a... Uh, a good mental space, but every once in a while you make a really big advance. And I well, think this was a yeah. yeah. This, I think the sculptures is a big step, leap forward, and it, it, it well, you know you you this was the color was a big leap forward mm -hmm. too, yeah, and, and then the you made another leap when you uh, made paintings more relatable to the 21st century. I mean, you're moving right along with the times, mm -hmm. old dear. You mm -hmm. truly are. And now the subject matter is changing again, and uh, you did, and they're in the show upstairs, in the Spacelander field. Mm -hmm. And I think, the, and there, um, I told him I thought the one on the left there looked like a praying mantis. He said other people have said that as well. But those are Spacelanders. We mm -hmm. are um, moving forward, and we're going to put just regular people in space uh, before too much longer. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, and there they are. And, and I also want to talk about your uh, large brush strokes that mm -hmm. you use, and you use impasto, mm -hmm. and that's sort of in the sculptural realm on a, on a flat painting. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I think, you know, looking back in, to moving to Rome after my uh, time at Yale, I, be, I walked around a lot. I saw very famous canvases, Caravaggio's mm -hmm. and the stuff, but what really, I think, looking back, really enthralled me was this kind of low relief carvings on a lot of things. It was, most of it was done really cheaply, but, you know, vines mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking of those kind of whimsically as buttons and, you know, and things like that. And those, that's, those ideas slowly, through like a visual metamorphosis, entered my work, and, and I started building up impostos because I wanted to... I wanted somebody to, to try to interface with my work, mm -hmm. you know, because our society is so much about the interface mm -hmm. and trying to get them to want to press a button. And then when, from a distance, it might, you know, be a solid color, but mm -hmm. it's really thick. And mm -hmm. you might read that as flat, and then you might have one that looks like it's off the canvas, but it's an illusional thing that I painted that stays flat. And I wanted to play with those expectations because people don't really look at the surface of everything. They look through it. They look through the screen into a world, and mm -hmm. I want to bring people back to the surface. Um, but that's it, television. Yeah. I mean, we look through the screen mm -hmm. into the lots and lots of people that are sitting out there, and we want them to bring them back in, and right. that's really what you're doing. In a way, yeah, I want to bring them to back to like the physical kind of realm of uh -huh. the material, 
to kind of break that down. And so there's a disconnect, but at the same time, it, there's a connection. Mm -hmm. And everybody makes that differently from themselves. Um, yeah, so. See, I, I, just, I think that's, um, I, I, I picked a, a, an image, and it looks to me sort of like a purple bird. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring that up, and, and mm -hmm. I want you to talk about that. Yeah, this is interesting because several people have pointed out the bird, and I actually didn't see that from the beginning, but now I do. <laughs> this is what I, I, I named a kiosk, an information kiosk. And this is something where if you went to, like somebody was getting married and you went to a store, and you would type in their name and they would spit out, you know, a piece of paper. And this, these, this set of series is interesting because it has shadows. So the top kind of shape is echo through the bottom. But there's also these kind of triangular shapes that look like beaks. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is where it becomes like, like the one that's a praying mantis, there's an anthropomorphic mm -hmm. change of mm -hmm. morphology mm -hmm. going on that in my mind I think relates to my interest in really ancient art from Assyria and stuff like this where mm -hmm. people's heads, whether they're kings or queens, are put on lions. You know, Egypt is famous for this. The ibis is on somebody's. Okay. And it's really silly, really. If you think about it, just really literally, it, it's, it looks like goofy. You know, why would you do that? You know, put, and, and, but here, it's, I think it's not so comical, but maybe it has to do with, with my interest in the natural world and environment along with technology and how these things kind of line up. But does it really make any difference what that, for lack of a better word, that purple bird is? No, I think when it's done, I think, you know, some of them are going to be read differently, and mm -hmm. that's where you put it out there, and that's where you can be totally surprised. And, um, and, and you have to let it kind of be what it is. Um, I might, na you know, na it might, everybody might see a bird and then they might read the title and they say kiosk and then they're like, wow, now, I, <laughs> I, now I'm seeing two things. How would this yeah. bird be a kiosk or is it really a bird? What is, you know, or is this a crane or something like that? And so it becomes this kind of, it can but become. isn't that the purpose of art to show the, the looker a different dimension and to and to allow them to be creative just as you've been creative in creating that piece of art you're asking them to not so much think like you but think with you yeah I would say one of the best things that somebody could take away from the art and that I've heard is is that when they after they see one of these and they see its kiosk or they see it's a shredder or a laptop and they go back to using theirs or interfacing with an ATM, a lot of people say they can't think of anything but my work. And, you know, why is this thing so boring that where I'm getting my money from, this gateway, this ATM, you know, why can't they spruce this thing up? Or I hear all kinds of things, you know. Uh, Somebody's going along and tie bows on the next ATM machine that they see. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there, there is this that when they step out into the, the world that they're in, they're thinking in a different mindset because they've seen the work, you know, and, and I think that's that's really. But that's what you want them to do. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I think that's that's when it really is really working. And you you it's, used it's a word that I thought was sort of interesting too that I like to pull out of you too, when you were talking about your one of the the pieces, you said that people read them differently. Mm -hmm. That to me was sort of an interesting word. Uh, you could have said interpret. You mm -hmm. could have said say see things differently. But you said read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the way people um, look at these images, partially because they usually, in the paintings cases, are usually an, um, an iconic symbol on a pretty monochrome or one color background, which has has can look like an icon on a desktop of a computer um, or a logo. And people tend to read those kind of ideas kind of fastly and make assumptions just from the outside contours. But I think you're, you're, when your brain's processing, it's reading in a narrative kind of way of how to put things together, especially in my paintings, because that's the way I approach them. Um, I, know, I realize people have different cognitive differences, but that's, that's the, what I think you have to, because you know, some people put my work into action and, it's, and I've started even titling them with some action kind of verbs. 
um, of what they were doing, what they are doing, what they're capable of doing. You know, and to me, that's like reading in into the work and also reading on the surface of the work. You know, is this a button or is this not a button? Can I use this or can I not use this? You know, it's it's that remote controller that you don't know how to work, but once somebody shows you how to work it, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's mystery's gone. You know, it's just a controller now. <laughs> you know, but before you, that, it's like, <laughs> do I am I going to break something? Does, what's this button do? And will I ever get back to where, you know? And, and do and you do you have to think a lot about the titles that you give to your things? Um, there on occasion I do. I I to me that um, uh, I've 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 given myself a lot more. I've gone with a more of a gut feeling as of late. You know, the, I I. And a lot of my titles have question marks because that shows the ambivalence I have about t titling them. Because they'll say like "shredder paused question mark." I'm not sure if the shredder is. If I'm being honest with myself, have I really? Is it really paused? Yeah. You know, is it is it just? Well, you could have a contest and have other people suggest titles for your work. Yeah, I you? could. <laughs> Yeah, children are really good at this. <laughs> they are. Yeah. They are. Yeah. Uh, just in the little time we have, like, where are you going? Are you changing your your style, your um, subject matter? Are you moving along with the century? Well, I, I am going to develop more the kind of rovers, this kind of idea. All my other work has is stuff that all of us can interact with and touch. And these are things that we actually, a very few of us, and the people that do that work on them wear suits can actually interact with. But what I find interesting is, is there, it's a, to me, they're like humanity's hand out on like a canvas of like a planet making marks. You know, and I really yeah. like that. Um, it, it really brings us together um, in a like way. Like the first footprint on the moon? Yeah. Yeah. But I like, with, the, with these things, you know, they're also kind of forlorn because when the sun, go, when it goes around and those solar panels are off, you know, they, they're, not, they're not charging. You know, they shut down, they sleep. And so that's created this kind of, kind of, I don't know, I just find it really fascinating. And, um, you know, robotics is a, a, a new area that, you know, where we can't go or shouldn't go or perhaps we shouldn't put people in danger. Um, you know, these things can really make a big difference. And um, I, I just find that really interesting. So I'm gonna develop that and I'm working on developing the sculptures quite a bit too. Well, and as I say thank you to Andrzej Zielinski, I would have to say you just keep thinking and you just keep turning out most interesting work. And I think that um, you capture the deceptive simplicity of the technology that is so essential to our lives. And keep on going, we'll be watching you because you are, after all, a local boy. And we're awfully proud, awfully proud. And I know that it's been, well, for me anyway, it's been a real pleasure, Ajay. And I hope you've enjoyed uh, meeting, uh, meeting Ajay as well. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.